Good morning and Boker Tov. That's how we say good morning in Hebrew. God bless you to all those that are able to be here with us this morning, both in person as well as <clears throat> those that are listening in on live stream and those that will be listening in on YouTube. I'm going to shake your screen up just a little bit there. <clears throat> Several things have happened over the last two days. Uh, in fact, this morning I got a beautiful text in from Brother Gary. He says that he, he woke up this morning and the Lord had showed him in a dream to tell me that not to worry, that God is with me. And uh, through all that I may go through. And uh, whatever I go through, I know my family goes through as well. And uh, one second, can you adjust the, that camera there just slightly? Turn real gently to the other way. There you go. A little bit more. There we go. Thank you, thank you. God bless you. <clears throat> um, this morning's message is inspired of events that I saw in a dream this morning. And I rarely ever speak about dreams, but this particular dream here, um, it was a very odd dream, but it's very powerful. And uh, we'll get to the details of the dream a little bit later in the message this morning. But let me say this to you that are watching. Um, it'll, it'll be hard for me to tell you what happened. I saw, though, myself or could hear myself, let me put it this way, I could hear myself preaching the very message that I was seeing in this dream. Um, we'll get to that in a little bit. I, I wanted to share with you something too. My wife, she bought me, those of you that can see this, the Bible she bought me. <clears throat> I love this Bible dearly because on this is the Christian Bible. It's... Um, it has uh, little lines on the side for being able to do notes where I make my own cross-references and stuff in there. And uh, the other day I made the mistake of leaving it on top of my car. And as I drove off, I heard something fall off. I was on the phone with someone. I was trying to deal with an issue that was happening. And when I laid it on top of the car, I wasn't paying attention. And uh, when I saw it fall, I immediately turned around it was in the highway, it was a six-lane highway, and I stood on the side of the road, and people would drive, and they would just, it was being straddled every time, and I just kept saying, Lord, please don't let nothing happen to it, and, and then one car after another began to hit it, and as they did, I just, in my heart, I thought about Yeshua as he was beaten on the cross, because you could just hear the thuds and stuff, and my heart just began to break as I saw the Bible being ran over, it just troubled my heart tremendously, and yet there was nothing I could do about it. I mean, to go out and try to rescue the Bible, I would have been killed instantly. Um, so I had to watch, and it really troubled my heart to see that. The cover tore off of it, but I went and as soon as the traffic was cleared, I was able to go and retrieve the Bible. And luckily, the pages were still intact because I do have a lot of notes, and I'm, I'll end up getting another one and then just transposing the notes to a new Bible. Um, but then this morning, I had a very strange dream. Um, it has to deal with repentance. It has to deal with Christ being in us and not just... Um, He's not just a God for us just to marvel at, uh, to say, oh, He's so wonderful. Or it's, it's far more than what we could ever imagine. And at the same token, when I woke up this morning and I just began to ponder about what I saw in this dream, then I began to realize that this message this morning is not only for those that are listening or that would watch on YouTube or those that are present here with us, this message is far-reaching. It's for both young, it's for both old, it's for the, the seasoned Christian, it's for the novice. 
It's what we have need of. It's about repentance. It's about you forgiving those that have done evil to you. And, not, and, and if someone has wronged you, it's about you making that right, forgiving them no matter what. You know, I'm, I think I, I could not help but think of the scripture where God says that he had invited so many people to his, to his uh, banquet, his, the, the wedding supper, and those that were invited all had excuses not to come. And so the Lord was angry at their excuses, and so he tells his servants to go out in and, and, and the highways and byways, and they go and they, they find some, they bring some in, they said, but there's still plenty of room, and and then he says, and I'm just paraphrasing, he talks about going out and compelling them to come in. Now the word compel, if you look it up, it's to force. And I, I saw in a place in this dream, and, and, I'll, and I'll try to tell you the dream the best I can here in a few moments there, but there was one place there where, um, and it was just kind of ironic, I know it wasn't anything in real life, but... Uh, I, I had I was I had my arms around a brother and I was just weeping and I told him I said you must forgive me and I, and even in my subconscious even like in the dream I'm like I know I hadn't done anything wrong you know but and maybe this person just represented Christianity as a whole or, or people as a whole that had been battered and bruised. I mean, the guy looked like he had been struck in a war or something. It's like he was shell-shocked. Let me just tell you where I was in the dream. I can't say specifically where because I really don't know where I was to start with in the dream. But I was talking to someone about, and I don't even know who the someone was, I was talking to them about having the blood of Christ. What would it be like to have been there? What would it have been like had we touched his blood. And I was just explaining that in this dream that what's important is that we have, we don't just speak about Yeshua, but we have him in us. That he becomes a part of us and that we become a part of him. And the next thing I know, I was on Calvary. And I was actually there at the cross. But I wasn't in a place to where it was far back where you could see a panoramic view or anything like that. I was right there where his feet were. I could see his feet, I could see his legs, and I could even see his side. And as I walked up to him, my feet had to walk through his own blood. I could hear in the background the song that I was playing when this message started, and I could hear that lady singing, I am yours, Lord. And he was there, and he was dead, lifeless on the cross. And all I could think of was I wanted to get him off that cross. And I reached my arms around his waist. And I began to try to lift him up off of that cross. And his blood just come all over me. 
And I kept hearing that song over and over and over. I am yours, Lord. And I could feel, uh, you know, it, it was so real. I could feel everything about it. I could feel the stickiness from his blood where it had dried upon him. It was part wet and part dry. And I was trying to get him off. I thought he shouldn't have to be here like this. And then I realized that the problem is too many people leave him on the cross. People don't want to get him off the cross and get, them, get him into their hearts. They talk about him and they speak about him, but he's not, he's not become real inside of them. Instead, we speak about Yeshua as a figure that's on the cross and we leave Him there. His blood must be applied. I sit here with the Word open and I know it's important that we read the Word, so let me just tell you here, this is from Matthew's Gospel, the 27th chapter. Beginning at verse 36, and sitting down, they watched him there and set up over his head his accusation written, this is Jesus, the King of the Jews. They just watched him. Then were there two thieves crucified with him, one on the right hand and the other on the left. And they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads and saying, Thou shalt destroy us the temple and buildest it in three days. Save thyself if thou be the Son of God. Come down from the cross. And you have to keep in mind he's still alive at that moment. It were Jewish people mocking him. Maybe even Romans as well, seeing as it was a Roman city. Israel was under occupation. And the only time Israel's ever been under occupation is because of our sins. But had he come down, he would have saved no one. Had they delivered, had Judah delivered his brother, um, maybe that was Reuben, I forget right offhand. But anyway, the, the one that wanted to deliver Joseph from the pit, had he delivered him, there would have been no salvation for Israel. They would have died in the famine. Joseph had to have been thrown in the pit. Had he not been thrown in the pit, there would be no 12 tribes today. God did it to save life. The same with Yeshua. Likewise also the chief priests mocking him with scribes and elders said, He saved others himself. He cannot save if he be the king of Israel, let him come down from the cross and we will believe him. You know, that's what it takes for the Jews to believe is when he comes off the cross. Because the only way you'll ever believe in him is when you get him off the cross and in your heart. Yeshua just being on the cross will do you no good. And you know, it's interesting that the Scripture actually says there 
Likewise, also the chief priests mocking him with the scribes and elders. You remember when Moses was in the wilderness journey there 14 days into it, and they were all complaining and murmuring and saying, is God really with us or not? They were thirsting to death. They had nothing to drink. You know, the reason why they were thirsting was because God was trying to get Israel to recognize without his life in you, you will die. He was trying to get Israel to recognize something that only in the future could ever be truly satisfied. And God told Moses, take the elders of Israel with you and go out and smite the rock that it bring forth its waters. They were smiting him with their words and God knew that they would do that in the future. But it was the only way to bring forth life. So do not condemn the Jews when this is what they were called to do. And that one brother of Joseph's that wanted to deliver him, he wanted to deliver Joseph from that pit. But had he delivered him, had he been successful, then there would be no salvation. There were a remnant of Jews in the days of Yeshua that wanted to deliver him. But had they delivered him, had they saved his life and fought and died against the Romans, there would be no salvation, neither for the Jews nor the Gentiles. This is why I say you have no idea. We have no right to condemn them. God swore that he would bring them back to their homeland, not for their sake. He says, not for your sake, O Israel, in Ezekiel 36, not for your sake, but for my name's sake, I'll bring you back from every nation where there I scatter, scattered you to. So regardless of what it seems like going on in Israel right now, they're there because God is going to deliver them and they're going to take Finally, they're going to take Jesus off the cross and they're going to get him in their hearts. Do you know that 3,500 years ago, when God commanded Moses, in order for the death angel to pass over your home, they took and he said, take a lamb, one for each family. And you were to kill the lamb. I don't know if you've ever had to do anything like that. But it did happen to me one time. It wasn't a lamb, but it was a young little deer. And he was wounded. And the thing was, is I was the one that caused his wound. But just like in biblical times, I had to lay my head, hand on his head. And it wasn't anything illegal. It was actually a law that allowed it. But I didn't realize that God was going to give me an experience that would never leave me for the rest of my life. And I was weeping because the fact that he was only wounded. And see, that's what we've done to Yeshua. Our sins, our day-to-day -day lives, when, we, when we're bitter against someone else in our life, when we say something evil to hurt a person, or that person says something evil to hurt us, we're wounding him. When we lie, when we cheat, when we steal, whatever we're doing that is not godly, we're wounding him. And then I had to lay my hand on his little head, and I, was, I had to the way I'd been taught as a young man that you, that you'd take the life by you'd have to cut its throat for it to bleed out and as I did he began to blate like a lamb blates and I just began to cry like a baby and I said Lord I said that's what happened to you you bled out on Calvary and you were blading in an unknown tongue to the world. My God, my God. Eli, Eli. 
Lama why have you forsaken me? When God gave the command to Moses, though, that they were to take the lamb, someone in that family had to lay their hands upon that little lamb and somebody had to take its life. And they had to place the blood over the door and on the post of the door. This is why there is a cross. It represents the door. You may not have been the one to have taken his life. Just like 3,500 years ago when the children of Israel were in Egypt and they were in bondage. But somebody in that family had to do it. And had they not done it, I'm sure the children were not a part. I'm sure the wife was not a part of that. It was no doubt the husband that had to be the part. It was the thing that men did. They did this part here, and they took that life. Isn't it interesting that the wife would have not have been the one to do it? Why? Because she typed out the bride of Yeshua. And the bride of Yeshua was not the one that had to take his life. It was a Jewish man. And then that blood was placed on the door and on the post. Because God knew that there would be a thief beside him that would believe. So he did it for your sake. And if you take two crosses like that, you have a door. And he has that door. After the lamb was killed and the blood had been applied, then the lamb had to be roasted. Yeshua was in the heat of the day. And the way you roast a lamb is you place it on a stick, a board, and you roast it over an open fire. It's not in the flames. And Yeshua, when he died in the heat of the day, when his body was there in the open sun, but he gave his life for us. After the lamb was roasted, you were required to take and eat it. And we were required to eat standing up in haste. Do not put it off. And they were to leave in haste because God knew that he was going to harden the Egyptians. You need to get him off the cross. If you've never accepted Yeshua as your own Savior, if all you've done is talk about Him, then get Him off the cross. Get Him in your life. And don't waste time. You must do it quickly. Satan is like Pharaoh the Egyptian. And we have a Pharaoh in the land today sitting in the Vatican. And soon, God will harden his heart and will send him after you. You better have eaten that lamb Eat, eating the lamb represent the word of God. 
Consume every word that you possibly can. Let it become part of you. But don't let him stay on the cross. God bless you. I want to pray for you. Regardless of where you are. I don't care how stooped in sin you may be. In fact, those were the people that believed him. Were the ones that were at their worst. The ones that were proud and high-minded never believed him. But if you want to give your life to Him, there's no better time than right now. And we're going to pray with you. If you're a Jewish person, you can contact me easily. There's a place on um, our website, israelreturns.com that you can take and click on contact and you can email me. Put it to my attention that you want to be saved. Let me know that you need prayer or whatever the case may be. Whatever we can do to help you, we're here to help you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, 2,000 years ago, thereabout, Lord, you came down and you became the very Lamb of God. You gave your life so that we could have eternal life. When you, your side was opened up on Calvary, Lord, the Bible records that your water was separated from your blood and it came out of your side, Lord. You said to the woman at the well, if you knew who it was that was talking to you, you'd ask me for a drink and I would give you water. You don't have to come here anymore. You gave her a sign to look for that she would know that the water that come from the rock would be before her soon. Just like in the wilderness journey, the rock that followed Israel wherever they went. And here that rock was moving around again. The rabbis even note that, Lord, that that rock followed Israel wherever they went. He's still following us to this day. He's only waiting for us to take Him off the cross. Bury Him in our hearts so that He can come alive. We know, Lord, that there is a seed that comes from a flower, like a sunflower. That seed can be planted in the ground and it'll come to life. I pray, oh God, the people that are listening that do not know you personally like that, Lord, may they take the very seed of your life and plant it inside of their hearts and you will become a mature Christian. You will grow inside of them. You may not look like much of a Christian to start with when you first do that, but just plant His Word inside of you and God. Just water it with His Word day and night. And the next thing you know, people won't see you anymore. They will see Jesus Christ. They will see Yeshua living in you. And then you will have this testimony as the apostles did. They've taken note that they had been with Jesus. God bless you. And we pray this in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach.